Hello, this is Ross Bliley from the podcast Pigskin Tales. This podcast is sponsored by Sterling Soap Company. With products sold throughout 41 locations around the globe, Sterling Soap Company has a unique assortment of products to choose from for your loved one for the holidays. Handmade artisan soaps created by Roderick and Amanda Lovin since 2012, these products are affordable and provide great value. Act now and save on your shipping costs. If you purchase $75 or more, your shipping cost is free in the United States. Shop now online at sterlingsoap.com. Face off with Firefly Publishing for another drop into the fascinating world of pro hockey history with Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2. Following his bestseller, Hockey historian and writer Eric Zwig opens the doors to the Pro Hockey Hall of Fame, revealing a treasure of untold tales, bizarre incidents, and captivating trivia that will leave the most devoted puckhead astounded. Just to name drop a few of the players he's included in this book are Wayne Gretzky, Yaromir Yager, and Bobby Hull. Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2 is a must read for pro hockey fans who crave more than just scores and statistics. Mr. Zwig invites you to uncover the true stories that have shaped the sport, ensuring that you will never look at the game of hockey the same way again. So skate on over to Amazon.com, Target, and Walmart to get your copy now. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Hello once again, sports fans. You are tuned in to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. And right now you're checking out the series that we're doing here called Historical NFL Matchups for Week 12 of the 2024 NFL season. I'm your host, Dana Augusta, here with you once again. And if you are returning, welcome back. And if you're new here, please pull up a chair for our conversation about the best of pro football from back in the day. And what we do in these episodes is talk about NFL matchups This weekend, that are rematches of great games from the NFL's illustrious past. And this week, we have four games that are landmark games in the history of the National Football League. One of the games that we're talking about is one from the 1998 playoffs that established a new superstar wide receiver that was the heir apparent to the greatest receiver of all time and submitted a fitting sequel to one of the greatest moments in not only the history of his team, but the entire league itself. Meanwhile, with Thanksgiving next week, it is appropriate to celebrate one of the most memorable games ever to take place on Turkey Day. In one Thanksgiving game, a superstar quarterback goes down and in comes a little-known rookie signal caller that leads a miracle comeback against one one of the NFL's elite teams. Another game that we will highlight, we have to go back to the early 1960s that most NFL analysts at the time considered a major upset. In this memorable game, this franchise that would later become one of the NFL's most consistent winners would accomplish something that wouldn't be done again in the NFL for another 41 years. And finally to go from the sublime to the ridiculous. In perhaps the strangest moment in the, in the 1982 regular season, in which that season everything seemed to be strange, a game came down to not only not a key play or key player or play call or even a crucial penalty. In this game between two longtime bitter division rivals, it came down to, of all things, a convicted felon and a John Deere tractor. So, have I piqued your interest? Well, I certainly hope so. So sit back, relax, and get yourself ready for week 12 of the NFL season as we head full speed into the NFL playoffs as well as Thanksgiving. You're listening to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast where we give you the best of sports from back in the day here on the Sports History Network. On January 3rd, 1999, the San Francisco 49ers were in that sort of precarious position that most great teams eventually find themselves when the stars that made the team great begin to pass the torch to younger players to maintain the success of the past. 
It certainly appeared that that was the case when the San Francisco 49ers were hosting one of the new powers in the NFL, the Green Bay Packers, in the wildcard playoffs at Candlestick Park. The 49ers entered the game with a 12-4 record, once again winners of the NFC West, while, Brett, while the Brett Favre-led Packers were 11-5 and finished second in the NFC behind in the NFC Central, rather, behind the 14-1 Minnesota Vikings. San Francisco was led, of course, by Super Bowl MVP quarterback Steve Young and wide receiver Jerry Rice. Yet, there would be another 49er receiver that would be remembered for this game. Third-year wide receiver Terrell Owens of UT Chattanooga up to this point looked like he may be the player to be the next leading receiver for the 49ers that would eventually replace Jerry Rice. Yet for most of this game, it appeared to be a game that Owens would eagerly want to forget. On the 49ers' first possession, Owens would fumble at midfield and would be recovered by Green Bay, which would lead to an early Ryan Longwell field goal to make the score 3-0. Later in the quarter, the Niners would capitalize on a Green Bay turnover on the Packer 19-yard line. After a pair of running plays that netted 18 yards, Young would connect on a one-yard touchdown pass to tight end Greg Clark to put San Francisco up 7-3. <laughs> on the next Packers possession, Favre drove the Packers 62 yards, which was helped out by a 22-yard gain by Darcy Levens on fourth and short. That led to a two-yard touchdown pass from Favre to Antonio Freeman to regain the lead 10-7. San Francisco would quickly tie the game at 10 apiece as 49er kicker Wade Ritchie would convert on a 34-yard field goal. And right before the half, Darcy Levens would cap off a 7-play, 83-yard drive on a 2-yard touchdown run to give the Packers a 17-10 lead at halftime. And the shootout was now on. On the first series of the second half, Favre looked to extend the lead. But the Packers' initial drive of the second half was abruptly ended when San Francisco defensive back Lee Woodall intercepted Favre that kick-started a five-play, 33-yard drive that culminated in an eight-yard touchdown catch by Clark for his second score of the day, tying the score at 17-17. However, the play right before Clark's touchdown reception, Owens was wide open in the end zone for an easy touchdown catch and dropped it. He fumbled earlier in the game and as well as dropping a total of four passes during the course of the game. Easily, Owens was having a game that he would most want to forget. With the game tied at 17 apiece, the 49ers would once again regain the lead on a Richie field goal to make the score 20-17. In the fourth quarter, both the Packers and Niners would exchange field goals, making the score 23-20 midway in the fourth. With 16, with 616 remaining, San Francisco cornerback Darnell Walker intercepted another far pass and returned it to the Packer 40-yard line. But the Niners were forced to punt after Owens had a sure first down reception that he dropped, his fourth drop of the game. And once again, seemingly, he would a game that he would most want to forget once again. After the punt, the 49ers would retake the lead on a 15-yard touchdown to Freeman for the second time to end a 90 and 89-yard touchdown drive. And with just under two minutes to play in the game, San Francisco found themselves down 27 to 23. On the first play of the drive, Young would complete a pass to Jerry Rice, his first and only catch of the afternoon, but he appeared to fumble. He was ruled down by the official, but on the replay, it showed that Rice was not down. Yet there was no instant replay to aid officials, so the play calls, so the play stood as called. On San Francisco, led by Steve Young, completed seven of nine passes for 76 yards, placing the ball on the 25-yard line with eight seconds remaining. Facing third down and three from the Packers 25, Young would throw over the middle, and in the midst of three Packer defenders, Owens who dropped four passes and lost a fumble, held on for the game-winning touchdown with three seconds remaining. Owens, who was overcome with emotion, was congratulated by his teammates as the Niners reclaimed a 30-27 win over Green Bay, marking the first time that the 49ers had beaten the Packers in the playoffs. This moment, this game and the moment mirrors a similar catch 17 years earlier to the nearly to the day 
when Dwight Clark caught the game-winning touchdown catch in the end zone to end a back-and-forth game. The game, known as one of the greatest games in league history, is forever known this one as The Catch Part 2. On November 28, 1974, it was Thanksgiving Day and the yearly appearance on Turkey Day by the Dallas Cowboys. Their opponents that day was their long-standing rival, the Washington Redskins at Texas Stadium. And entering the game, Washington was 8-3 on the season while the Dallas Cowboys were 6-5 and, and would undergo sort of a rebuilding program at the end of the season that saw the departures of several stars such as running back Walt Garrison, wide receiver Bob Hayes, and defensive lineman Bob Lilly. This Thanksgiving game started out as a field goal fest as the first four scores were field goals. Dallas opened the scoring with a 24-yard field goal which was set up by a surprise fake punt when punter Dwayne Carroll connected with defensive back Benny Barnes. Later in the quarter, it was followed by a Mark Mosley 45-yard field goal to tie the game at three. In the second quarter, Washington would extend their lead with two more Mosley field goals to make the score 9-3. In the third quarter, disaster seemed to strike for Dallas. On one of his patented quarterback scrambles, Dallas quarterback Roger Starbuck would gain, would gain a valuable first down when the Dallas offense seemed to struggle. Yet on the play, Starbuck suffered a severe concussion and he would miss the remainder of the game. Now entering the game was a little-known rookie quarterback named Clint Longley from Abilene Christian. Now, Washington would take full advantage as Cowboy Dwayne Thomas would score, former Cowboy Dwayne Thomas would score on a nine yard touchdown pass from Billy Kilmer to extend their lead to 16 to three. With Longley now in the game, Dallas off, Dallas's offense finally found his rhythm. After completing a couple of passes, the rookie from Abilene Christian connected on a 35-yard touchdown pass to tight end Billy Joe Dupree to cut the Washington lead to 16-10. But before the end of the quarter, Dallas would take the lead as running back Walt Garrison would score. And on Efren Herrera's, Efren Herrera's extra point, Dallas would have a 17-16 lead heading into the final quarter. In the fourth, Washington would retake the lead as Dwayne Thomas, looking to exact a measure of revenge on his former team, would take a Billy Kilmer handoff and go left and sprint down the sideline for a 19-yard touchdown run to retake the lead with less than three minutes to go. On Dallas's final drive with Starbuck still out of the game, Longley started their final if not futile drive. With less than a minute to play, Dallas was facing a 4th and 6 from the Washington 44-yard line. On the play, Longley eluded the Washington rush and hit Bob Hayes for a 6-yard gain, barely enough for the first down. And now with the ball resting on the famed star on the 50-yard line of Texas Stadium, and with 35 seconds left, Longley, who in his off time hunted rattlesnakes for fun, bit the Washington defense and uncoiled a deep pass down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson beat Washington defensive back Ken Stone for a 50-yard touchdown pass to give the Cowboys the lead with 28 seconds remaining and the crowd of 64,000 went wild. After Herrera's extra point gave the fired-up Cowboys a one-point lead at 24-23, the Redskins still had a chance, but that chance was quickly extinguished as Kilmer would be sacked and fumbled and the ball would be recovered by defensive lineman Harvey Martin to seal the game. Longley, after coming off the bench, went 11 of 20 for 203 yards and a pair of touchdowns. But despite Longley's heroics, it would be the beginning and the end of his Dallas career. The next season he would be traded to the San Diego Chargers and eventually out of the NFL. But his performance on Thanksgiving Day of 1974 continues to live on. Now when you're an expansion team, you are expected to sort of stumble out of the gate in your very first season. Unless you're the Las Vegas Golden Knights. 
But for the Minnesota Vikings in 1961, getting off to a slow start was expected. Their expansion, par- their expansion partners, the Dallas Cowboys, who entered the NFL one season earlier, went 11, went 11 and one in their first year. And the only thing that the fans of the in the state of 10,000 Lakes were really hoping for was just to be competitive. On September 17, 1961, the Minnesota Vikings took the field for the first time ever and their opponents that afternoon was one of the flagship franchises of the NFL and one of its current powers, the Chicago Bears with legendary head coach Papa Bear George Hallis. Now this afternoon would establish not only a new team in the NFL, but three players that would become fixtures for the Vikings for years to come. In their first game, the Vikings starting quarterback was former Baltimore quarterback George Shaw. However, head coach Norm Van Brocklin, who had led the Eagles at quarterback the season before and won the NFL championship, decided to replace Shaw in the first quarter with a rookie quarterback from Georgia named Fran Tarkington. Also making debuts for the Vikings that afternoon was offensive lineman Grady Alderman and defensive end named Jim Marshall, who would be key contributors for Minnesota for the next decade plus. Also with the Vikings was future Hall of Fame running back Hugh McElhenney, who was there to sure up the Vikings offensive backfield. The Vikings would open the scoring in the game with a 12-yard field goal by Mike Mercer. Then Minnesota would extend the lead to 10 to nothing as Fran Tarkenton would hit by, would find Bob Snelker on a 14-yard touchdown pass, his first of 342 scoring tosses of his career. The Bears would get on the scoreboard later in the quarter as fullback Rick Caceres would score on a three-yard touchdown run to cut the lead to 10 to six as the extra point was missed. And as both teams went into halftime, the Vikings surprisingly had a 10 to six lead over the mighty monsters of the Whit Midway. In the third quarter, the Vikings put the game away. Yes, the expansion Vikings put away the Bears. Two scoring tosses by Tarkington in the third quarter, one to tight end Jerry Reeshnow and another to McElhenney, gave the Vikings an impressive 24-6 lead in their inaugural game. And in the fourth quarter, the Vikings' onslaught would continue as Tarkington would throw his fourth touchdown pass, this one to Dave Middleton, to give them a 37-6 lead in the fourth quarter. The Bears would add a touchdown late in the game, but it was his, but history had been made as the Vikings won their inaugural game against the Bears, blowing them out 37-13 at Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington. The Vikings became the first expansion team to win their debut since 1950 when the Cleveland Browns won their first game against the champion Philadelphia Eagles. No expansion team will repeat this feat until 2002, some 41 years later, when the Houston Texans would defeat the Dallas Cowboys in their first ever game. Now, when fans and sports historians look back on the 1982 NFL regular season, one word is often in agreement to describe that year. Weird. A 57-day player strike reduced the season from 16 games to 9 games, and instead of the 5-team playoffs in both conferences, the NFL had a 16-team Super Bowl tournament as teams battled it out to play in Super Bowl 17 in Pasadena. Yet, that was still a few weeks away from this game. In a year of weird occurrences, the game between the Miami Dolphins and the New England Patriots in Foxborough on December 12, 1982 was emblematic of the unusual and bizarre nature of the NFL in 1982. The night before the game, heavy rains had soaked the AstroTurf surface of then Schaefer Stadium. Then as the temperatures began to plummet, the field froze over. Then conditions went really bad. Right before kickoff, a snowstorm hit the Boston area as the field became completely covered with snow. As the snowfall intensified, game officials decided to put in an emergency ground rule into play where officials could call timeout and allow the grounds crew to use a snowplow to clear yard markers. Yet the snow was falling so heavily, the grounds crew could not plow often enough to keep the field clear. In any event, 
offenses for both teams became totally useless against the deteriorating conditions. The teams remained scoreless until late in the fourth quarter. Then, with 4.45 to play in the game, Patriots head coach Ron Meyer motioned snowplow operator Mark Henderson and instructed him to clear a spot on the field for New England place kicker John Smith. Henderson drove his John Deere tractor and cleared a spot as instructed as Smith did the rest, connecting on the field goal giving the Patriots a slim 3-0 lead. Yet the Dolphins had one last drive. As the Dolphins mounted a drive, Henderson was moving his tractor along with the action in case he would be called on again. Yet with the Dolphins in field goal range for kicker Uwe Von Schaumann and facing a fourth down, Miami coach Don Shula decided to go for it. Dolphin quarterback David Woodley would be intercepted by linebacker Don Blackman to end the drive and secure the 3-0 Patriot win. After the game, Dolphins coach was irate. Shula believed it was against the league rules. He pointed out that the league's unfair act clause allowed the league to overturn the game result. Later that week, Shula met with NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle concerning his protest. And although Rozelle agreed with Shula that the use of the plow gave the Patriots an unfair advantage, he said that he had never reversed the result of a game and was not going to start doing so for any reason especially since there was no rule in place at the time explicitly barring the use of a snowplow. Therefore, by the letter of the law, it wasn't illegal. Meanwhile, the snowplow operator Mark Henderson, who was employed at the stadium as part of a prison work release program, is now among such Patriot heroes as Gino Capaletti, Steve Grogan, John Hanna, and now Tom Brady. And Henderson supplied the best quote in the postgame. A reporter said that Shula was going to report the supposed illegal use of the snowplow to the commissioner and was asked what he thought of that. His reply, what are they going to do? Throw me in jail? And folks, that will do it for the week 12 edition of the Historically Speaking NFL Matchups mini episode. Thank you guys once again for listening. We'll try to come out with these mini episodes every week during the NFL's regular season, highlighting great and memorable games from the long history of the National Football League. And as usual, this podcast comes to you from the Bill King Memorial Studio in the sports wing of TM4 Enterprises, located in suburban Atlanta in the shadow of Stone Mountain. And to get more content of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, you can check us out on various social media platforms such as Twitter, as well as Blue Sky and Threads. And also, if you choose to, you could contact us at historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com. And if you have not done so already, please, please subscribe to the show. Tell your family, tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Hell, tell a passerby on the street about us if you think they like sports history. And until the next time, stay blessed, stay cool, and be your best in everything that you do. It will make the world a much, much, much better place. Thanks, guys, and peace out. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned... We're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sports historynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you 
don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.